Welcome back to TYT Sports, everybody. I have uh, I am being joined today by a uh, an author, a baseball. I want to say wizard, not to pump you up too much, but uh, and somebody truthfully that I've watched since I was a kid, <laughs> and that man happens to be Keith Law. We are joined by and uh, truly excited for this conversation. I don't get to talk about baseball as much as I want to. If I turned into a baseball channel. I'd be thrilled. I don't know how many of our global audience would also be, but Keith, thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, first off, how you doing? Second off, we got to start talking about some smart baseball. Yes, absolutely. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's been a you know, the book came out 17 days ago. That sounds right. So yeah, I'm a little tired. It's been <laughs> a lot. I'm traveling. <laughs> Um, it's a lot of radio hits, a lot of the same questions over and over again. Um, you know, after a while, you start to worry you're sounding like a robot. Right. Uh, <laughs> I start to worry I'm sounding like a robot. Uh, but you know, it's good. Interest is good. I mean, the fact that people want to talk about it, people seem to like the book. You know, it could be a lot worse. People could have said it was terrible, or no one could have called. Says, oh, no, we'd we'd rather not have you on the radio. <laughs> so, no, things are good. What's great is it's. I know for a fact it's selling far better than the big baller brand shoes, and that's what's most important. <laughs> but <laughs> is that that. Uh, Oh, crazy dad, right? <laughs> that's, that's, that is uh, Alonzo yeah, Ball. This, this is my yeah. knowledge of other sports. That's, that's yes. Well, look, I'm you've been in the baseball him. scene, um, and I'm not trying to age you, just much longer than I've been able to talk about baseball on camera for. But in general, uh, smart baseball takes this precedent that we don't have to take these older baseball stats, the one as you mentioned in the earlier parts of the book on the back of the baseball card, which it still applies to me, it still applies to anybody collecting baseball cards. You have your mm -hmm. average, you have home runs, RBIs, and truthfully, even in the worlds of fantasy baseball, it, it still is how things get ranked. And you start with batting average, you work your way over in the book into one of my favorite sections, which I have to say, and I don't want to give away too much because I would love people to go out and buy the book, uh, wins, which from a young age, I've always felt that doesn't seem like a fair way to, uh, to determine right. how good a pitcher is. Felix Hernandez kind of broke the glass ceiling on that one in his 12, or I think it was 13 and 12 year and started to get recognition for the Cy Young in those awards. But my biggest question is, how do you get everybody else to follow this and say we shouldn't be making batting average the reason someone wins a batting title. So the impetus for the book was reader questions, but I think the stronger argument, and I mean reader, readers asking, you know, can you point me to a book that can do mm. what, what I tried to do in smart baseball, explain why these stats are bad, why these other stats are better, et cetera. But I think the better argument for why you need to know this stuff is all 30 teams are doing this now. Mm -hmm. And I really talk a lot in the book and I've been talking on the radio a lot, just everywhere. Say, I, I don't care if you, Mr. Beat Writer or Mr. National Columnist, don't actually buy into you know, new stats, uh, newfangled, whatever you want to call it. They always have some terrible <laughs> you know, Luddite way of referring to sabermetrics or baseball analysis. I, I don't care if you don't buy it. All 30 teams buy it. So you have to be aware of this. You can't cover the sport and not understand this core philosophy now that is part of every baseball operations department's way of going about their business. And I would say even the same is somewhat true for fans. You don't have to, now fans, it's less of an obligation, but it's more, do you want to follow along? Do you want to understand why the twins are taking this player over that player in the draft? Why, the, why Atlanta chose to rebuild and went after certain types of players? If you want to follow along with the thinking of your favorite team, then you need to understand what basic beliefs they hold. And that means throwing out a lot of the old traditional assumptions about certain player stats and certain player abilities that I target in another chapter on myths and understand instead what are the types of statistics that they're looking at. And again, what, what do they value in a player? What do we know really matters for a pitcher? What do we know really matters for a hitter? or for a fielder. That's all changed with the advent of these new statistics. So the statistics are, are there, and I do tell you which ones I think are good and, and less good, but also they help tell the story of how teams are thinking about players now. What's so interesting about your point here is that, as, you, as you're mentioning, to the beat writer, to the national, even national radio host, to the, to the uh, upper rankings of sports media and TV, mm -hmm. if the 30 teams are doing it and you seem to have had insight because you at one point were in the front office for, it was the Toronto Blue Jays if I'm correct. Yes. So 
Not only are you, not only do you know that it's happening, you don't mm -hmm. even really need any more evidence or proof of it. Because when I look just on the surface level, right, um, mm -hmm. I think of two teams who never had those original statistics, but they won the only statistic that all teams should care the most about, the World Series. Mm -hmm. The Giants won a year where I believe none of their players had over 100 RBIs. I think actually the highest was 83. Um, mm -hmm. And the Kansas City Royals won with defense. They made you, they made you uh, get out. They made you make the play, make the out. They made you hit the ball and there was no other way around that. So I think it's so interesting that this new wave has come and all 30 teams are doing it. Do you think that there's any specific teams who are even one more step ahead than the others? Or are we looking at teams like, I mean, the Yankees have seemed to return to prominence over my beloved Mets, which is okay, <laughs> I'll live with this. But the Giants, all of a sudden, odd year, even year of all the dumb stats in the world, that might be it. But That was pretty bad, <laughs> yes. It's a pretty bad stat, but my point being is, is there any team that is ahead of the game even more so? So now that everyone's doing it, you know, I say that I've used the line a few times mm -hmm. already this month that the revolution's over. Everyone's right. accepted that you must at least have an analytics presence in baseball operations. So the differences between sort of the best and the worst, there's no longer the, ha the, the yes, we're doing it, and then the no group, which last year was really like the Diamondbacks, and right. then everybody else was in the yes group. But now everyone's decided that they're using this stuff. So it's how you use it, how well you integrate the analytical work into the rest of baseball ops, or is it sort of a silo unto itself? I think the Cubs, um, it's not a coincidence that they won the World Series. They're extremely well integrated with analytics in terms of the field staff, amateur scouting, pro scouting, even player development. I think that's true for Cleveland as well, mm -hmm. um, particularly in terms of integrating analytics with the field staff, because Terry Francona comes from Boston, yes. where they were doing this before most other clubs were. The Astros are an interesting case where analytics probably has more prominence in their front office. It's got more greater importance or even power mm -hmm. than it does for a lot of other clubs. But that you will, I certainly, when I interviewed executives, I got more stories about Astros analysts working with coaches, like minor league coaches on the field on how to develop certain players or working with manager AJ Hinch, who's extremely stat savvy, just a, a very bright person to begin with and sort of hungry for this kind of knowledge. Give me information like that that can help me be better at my job. And that's kind of the main characteristic. Now, if I were hiring, if I were a GM or president looking to hire into a baseball front office, the number one characteristic I'd be looking for is that intellectual curiosity. I don't care if you actually have the database skills right now, um, unless I'm hiring you to be like the guy who cleans the stat cast data. But <laughs> you know, I don't need coaches who can run SQL queries, but you have to be intellectually curious because if you don't want to know the answers to questions or if you don't take that attitude, I want more information to help me do my job better, then how am I going to integrate you with the with my analytics department, get you to make better decisions uh, or change the way you think about the game entirely, which is what's happened the last 10 to 15 years and is something I'm, again, trying to sort of push through in the book without ever beating you over the head, without – there, you well, know, that's, this is my metaphorical, you know, you I'm, I'm wielding this to get people to onboard the stats <laughs> train. Like I don't, I, I shouldn't need to do that, right? Let me convince you by example, by showing you that all 30 teams have decided they believe this. I love the hammer, that's perfect. <laughs> it was uh, handy. It is very handy. I was gonna say the thing too, uh, especially cause I think some people might on the surface again, think this might just be a stat heavy book or too many analytics. It doesn't read that way. It doesn't read like you're looking at the matrix in a way. Right, um, no, I, I didn't what, want that at all. And um, when the original proposal and pitch, and I was very lucky Harper Collins picked it up mm -hmm. basically right away. And in the first conversations with them too, I, I, and I've been steady with this all along. I didn't want a ton of graphs. Yep. I didn't want a ton of charts. I, I had a researcher named Meredith Wills who did some early database work for me on some of the early chapters. And um, she offered to generate a ton of charts and graphs for me. It's really one of her specialties. She's got a PhD in astrophysics. She's fairly bright. But I didn't want <laughs> that stuff in the book because I was afraid that it would deter people from picking the book up or it might lose them. You know what, let me... I know what I'm good at, which is which is the words. Right. <laughs> um, I have the best words. Let me try to explain this in the, in basically plain English, as if two of us were sitting at a bar, coffee shop, and we're just talking about. And you just said, "All right, hey, tell me why saves are stupid." All right, you know what? Give me 20 minutes, set your timer, and let me just talk. And I'm not going to throw a bunch of numbers at you if we're in a conversation. So I didn't want to write it that way either. I thought I'd reach a lot more people if I just 
stuck to making arguments, again, as if I were just talking to the reader one on one. Right, and it reads that way, it's good. It's, it reads quickly, I would say I actually took it because uh, right before we were supposed to meet last Friday, I was actually mm -hmm. in Mexico on vacation, and I'm reading oh, nice. it on the beach, and people were coming by, and somebody did stop, and they said, you know, is, is that a novel? Like, is, like, is something <laughs> like, like, and I just said, yeah, it's great, trust me, it's like the art of fielding, you'll love it. <laughs> Let's go pick it up. Um, so it was a good read on the beach. Again, you're also talking to somebody, I'm a diehard baseball fan as it is, and I look for, I grew up in the Griffey era, I grew up in the steroid era of baseball, I grew up in all of that, and I'm still supportive of everything. Mm -hmm. People say 160 games, make it 262 games, I'll be happy with it, I'll be fine. Right, more yeah, reasons. I never understood the let's make the season shorter. What, you want less baseball? Who wants less baseball? The players baseball. do, and I understand that. Okay. But they as a fan, a I argument. do not want less baseball. <laughs> yeah. There's no point in my life where I say, I wish they weren't playing baseball today. Are you on the, would you believe, do you think they should make the first, the instead of a one game playoff, it should be at least three? No. No, you want one game? No. Um, I didn't like the inclusion of it to begin with, I, but yeah. what I particularly would dislike about expanding it to three, well, first of all, if you make it three, then someone's gonna want it to be five, and if you make it five, someone's gonna yes. want it to Eventually be seven. It's be like seven. feature creep, yes. like, that's inevitable. <laughs> but also, I don't know that there's a huge advantage to other teams in having, to the teams that essentially get the buy past the wild card game, right. to having that much more time off. It seems to be a mixed response, at least. There's the belief that that may not be so good uh, for hitters or for pitchers. It takes pitchers out of their routines, that it takes mm -hmm. hitters maybe get less used to seeing live pitching. I'm more inclined to think it'll screw up the pitchers. Pitching is so routine driven. Yes. Whereas hitters, like the good hitters just fall out of bed and hit. Like they don't forget how to hit over the all-star break. They probably wouldn't forget while well, two other teams played <laughs> right. a three game series. But I would worry about the impact on on uh, the pitching of the teams that got out of that first round. Yes, I, I, I'm so someone who watches, because I, I come from the fan perspective a lot of the mm -hmm. time. I haven't sat in the front office. I don't pretend I've ever sat in the front office. Uh, so when I watch Connor G hit a home run off the Mets in a one game playoff, I'm going, you know, this would be great if we had two more chances to <laughs> at least make it back. You know what, I will say there's one thing I really like about the one game any one game playoff. Because we've had, but even before that we had, you know, there would be a we've tie. Games, yes, for division titles. And it would be one game on that day. The one thing is now, thanks to social media, and I'm more Twitter than Facebook, but I'm mm -hmm. on I'm on both all the time. I mean, right. I keep tabs for those open all day. Yes. Is we're all watching the same game. It doesn't matter. Like people right. just baseball fans just watch. Like I'm not a fan of any of those teams, but it was the Mets Giants. Okay, I'm going to just watch. I'm going to watch that game, and uh, then to I can make a you know, an offhand crack about the game and everyone gets it because we're all watching the same thing at once. And watching that reaction and having this kind of ongoing freeform conversation for three hours because we're all tuned into the same thing, like that's a blast. That's one of the few times where I'm like, where I'm not complaining that Twitter is a cesspool, for example. No, actually their Twitter was pretty fantastic actually. And I look forward to that right. on wildcard days. Like I'm going to build my day around the game is on and I'm in front of social media talking to people. Uh, since you brought up Twitter, you have one of the most polarizing tweets I've ever seen. And I say that because it's one of the most important tweets. Mm -hmm. I believe it was after Kurt Schilling, and it had to mm -hmm. do with uh, science being more important than sports in this instance, in a moment of self-awareness, where a lot of, I think, there are a lot of petty beefs on Twitter. There's a lot of petty mm -hmm. beefs on social media, it's all, Whatever, I try to avoid it, but at the same time, we all get roped into them. Yep. Uh, science is more important. Um, I believe had to do with fossils, I believe. It. And the funniest thing I thought about this was, why would they argue with you, is my question. Because, and it's not just the baseball uh, side of it, it's your, if you just look at your resume, it's one of those things where, like, what are you getting after it? And how, I guess, in this sense, do you put up with it in such a drastic political landscape? Kurt was arguing, um, obviously Kurt still worked for us at the time. Right. And he was arguing that evolution is wrong, that <laughs> creationism was right. Uh, this is not true. Um, <laughs> I can't believe I even have to say that, but I've talked on Twitter about, I've just supported science. I've supported uh, vaccinations being both safe and effective. We have this rising climate of anti-vaxxer nut jobs uh, causing things like the measles to come back, where there's a measles epidemic happening in Minnesota right now among immigrant populations from Somalia who were targeted by anti-vaxxer, you know, I call them denialists, right. activists targeting vulnerable populations. And so Kurt was claiming creationism is true. He's just wrong. <laughs> I'm not a scientist, but I know 
what the science says on these, you know, these subjects where it's pretty settled. And went right after him where he was making some bold, ridiculous claims. And I, you know, tried to undermine them with facts, as I do. And someone told me to stick to sports, uh, to right. which, like, I'm in my mind when you say that, I'm giving you a middle finger. Right. <laughs> because just, I don't tell you what, to, what you can and can't talk about. Course. This is my Twitter account. I'll, I'll do what I want. But in that particular instance, too, it's, you know, we, we live in a, a climate where, oh, no pun intended, where science is extremely important to our futures, to our children's futures. It's huge in our political arena where we have a large swath of the body politic just denying science outright. And I said, you know what? Sports is fun and it pays the bills, but science is going to make much more of a difference in everyone's lives than baseball or sport in general ever will. And so if I'm forced to choose between standing up for baseball or standing up for science, I'm standing up for science. And to me, that was the kind of contribution I can make that even though it probably ends up being controversial, it, it just shouldn't be one. I'm just standing with the facts. Right, because, well, and I, look, I could say I'm at fault too, because I, I mean, in terms of the clickbait atmosphere and things, like, mm-hmm. I don't think people read past the headline anymore. And it's important too, because the headline itself might not be the conversation that's taking place. It's misleading right. to a certain extent, but you have to watch the discussion or look at the writing, especially coming from somebody who, who's had a tremendous impact in sports writing, baseball writing for Years on end. So uh, I wish we had more time. I can continue talking about this for for literally hours. <laughs> I think we could do a three hour live stream with this. Uh, I'm a fortunate person to this to the to the audience. So thank you, uh, Keith, for coming on. It was fantastic yeah. talking to you. I was going to say to the audience, I'm a fortunate person. I get to talk with the people that I looked up to growing up in terms of sports and and just the the landscape that is uh, this awesome awesome group of sports media figures. So uh, at Keith Law on Twitter. Ninety-five percent of the time, he's going to give you a great statistic. Five percent of the time, he might take down some uh, some crazy tweeters out there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, again, uh, Smart Baseball, it's in bookstores. It's on Amazon. I put a link to Amazon in the description. Does that work? Yeah, that works for me. I'm, I'm a millennial. I, I go to Amazon.com. That's fine. So do I. <laughs> Perfect. All the time. Yep. Perfect. Uh, Keith, again, once again, thanks for joining. Uh, we'll speak soon.